Good evening. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us this evening for this webinar on uh, financial resources and survival tips for surgical practices sponsored by the American College of Surgeons. This is Pat Bailey. I'm medical director for advocacy in the uh, DC office of the ACS. We are pleased to be joined this evening by Dr. David Hoyt, executive director and members of the senior staff of the Division of Advocacy and Health Policy in Washington, DC. We're also pleased to be joined by members of the Practice Protection Committee, uh, and they will be available uh, to assist in answering your questions at the conclusion of the webinar. We're gonna throw a lot of material at you in a reasonably short period of time, and I want to reassure you that everything and more that you hear tonight will be available to you in tomorrow's newsletter under the Practice Protection Committee section. There's a resource document there, uh, which will have all of the links that we reference relative to the financial protection uh, uh, resources, as well as uh, other resources on telehealth and um, some uh, practical suggestions and options to consider. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Hoyt for some opening remarks. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, I'd like to start out by welcoming everybody, and thanking you for all you're doing for your patients and, and all the Stress that this is credit to your practice. We want to try and uh, use tonight to uh, clarify some things that will hopefully help help you. And this has come out of a uh, committee that's been appointed during this time. Uh, it's headed by Dr. Jim Elsey, and I want to thank him for his contributions and all the other people on the Practice Protection Committee. We started out about uh, five or six weeks ago. Uh, uh, try and, and uh, talk about issues with regard to leadership from the standpoint of you all running your practices and, and maintaining uh, your positions of, of responsibility. And the first thing we, we got into was really to, to talk about the systematic way in which people would slow down their practice by avoiding elective surgery that could be put off. And, and we tried to create triage guidelines and ways to think that through. We tried to do that in the context of the available protection equipment and the uh, capacity issues we're enduring that we're seeing the peak of this uh, epidemic. And I think those things have been useful. They've, they've been very stressful for everybody. And in the meantime, people's practices have uh, shrunk and income has shrunk along with that. So we really do understand the impact that that's had on you. And tonight we're gonna try and uh, uh, focus on some of those issues. And the main communication vehicle we've used for the last four weeks or so has been a new newsletter replacing our previous newsletters. And hopefully you found that useful. It, it focuses on clinical issues, it focuses on uh, issues with regard to patient and, and physician uh, surgeon uh, safety. It focuses on uh, some things in terms of just promoting where we are with the epidemic. And then there's been a section on uh, regulatory and legislative aspects that have been focusing on things that are important to, to your practice survival, both economically and in terms of medical liability, et cetera. So uh, tonight's session, uh, is going to be focused on uh, really ways in which to uh, uh, deal with the economic side of your practice. Tomorrow's newsletter, I'll just give you a preview of it because it's already been announced tonight by the president that the uh, economy is going to start to reopen and people are going to very quickly and they've already started to ask, well, what about uh, resuming elective surgical practice? And we are seeing some people starting to do that. Followed by the pound or hash sign. Some practices starting to do that. And so in anticipation of that, we spent the last week to 10 days working with a number of other organizations to put together a set of guidance documents that will in general talk about restarting your practice in the context of, of appropriate uh, state, state regulation, state law. Also, a, a set of uh, guidelines that are in line with what the American Hospital Association, the AORN, and the American uh, Society of Anesthesiology. 
So I think you'll find those uh, documents useful. Um, they are going to have to be staged by each area, and they give you some guidelines as to how to go about that. But we are anticipating, hopefully, that we're at the beginning of the end of this, so that in addition to what you hear tonight on this webinar, hopefully those guidelines that you'll get tomorrow will help you start thinking about opening your practice. I'll turn it now back over to Patrick. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. White. As I mentioned earlier, we're joined tonight by these eight uh, surgeons who will be available to answer your questions during the uh, question and answer period. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge on these topics. Questions can be entered by typing them into the question box uh, found on your screen. I would like to start tonight by running through the programs that are available to provide financial assistance to you to tide you over uh, in this difficult time and unprecedented set of circumstances. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge up front two important items that were in the news today that you may have heard about. First relates to the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. CMS is expected to disperse its second round of funds soon from this fund. That couldn't come as early as tomorrow. We'll talk a little bit about what some of the speculation is about who will receive those funds when we cover it in detail. It was also reported today that the Paycheck Protection Program has expended all $349 billion in funds that was initially placed in it. However, we are still going to cover this program in detail tonight as it is widely expected that Congress will approve more funds for it in the near future and negotiations on that are ongoing. So we'll jump right in and we'll talk about the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. This was $100 billion that was in the CARES Act that Congress passed and the President signed at the end of last month. Last Friday, $30 billion of that $100 billion was dispersed. There was no action necessary on any hospital provider or, or surgeon's part to receive this. It was deposited in your account based on your taxpayer identification number, and you can look for it because it should have come from Optum Bank and was facilitated by United Healthcare. These are payments, they are not loans, and you will not be required to repay them. However, there is a terms and conditions attestation that is required that has to be completed within 30 days. In tomorrow's newsletter, we will provide you both with a link to the terms and conditions page as well as to uh, a link where you can sign the attestation. That, those funds that were deposited last week were based on your 2019 Medicare receipts. The conversion factor for that was 6.1%. As I mentioned, there are additional disbursements that are expected. Last week they had announced that the additional disbursements would be targeted to areas particularly impacted by coronavirus, uh, to rural providers, and to providers who have a lower share of Medicare slash higher share of Medicaid, thinking more about pediatric specialist OBGYNs. Today's uh, release uh, seems to indicate that it may be more targeted in this second uh, dispersal for those areas particularly impacted by coronavirus itself. More to follow on this, and again, it may be as early as tomorrow. We're now going to shift to the second of the four buckets that we're going to talk about in terms of financial resources and talk about the Medicare Advance Payments Program. Through this program, you can request three months of Medicare payments in advance. Those payments that you receive are essentially a loan against future Medicare claims that you would submit. This is accessed via request to your Medicare administrator contractor. People have been receiving these funds reasonably quickly because they, the, the MACs are required to review your request, turn over and issue the funds uh, within seven days. Report out last week that since it was its inception back on March the 30th, that there have been $34 billion in funds that have been provided through the Medicare Advanced Payments Program. After you receive the funds, you will continue to bill and receive Medicare payments as normal for 120 days. 
However, following those 120 days, all your billed claims will be used to offset the advance that you receive, and the entire balance must be repaid within 210 days. This obviously leads to some problems and questions that have been the source of some advocacy efforts that the Division of Advocacy and Health Policy are actively engaged in at the current time. We hope to extend the repayment period beyond the 90 days between 120 days and 210 days after receipt. Going along with that, we hope that we will be able to reduce the percentage of funds held back to offset the advance payment that received. Again, currently that's 100%. And we hope to be able to get that reduced. Finally, we hope to reduce the interest rate on any unpaid balance after whatever time runs for the repayment to something closer to the current federal funds rate, which as we all know is pretty, pretty low right now. Now shift to the Paycheck Protection Program. And again, I will acknowledge it's, it's widely reported today that the $349 billion that was approved for this fund in the CARES Act uh, has been expended. However, as I also said, I would be shocked if we did not see Congress come to some sort of an agreement to replenish this fund uh, in the coming days. A couple of key things to think about, know about the Paycheck Protection Program. You apply for this loan via your local bank or SBA approved lender. It is limited to entities with 500 or fewer employees. Perhaps the most important thing about the Paycheck Protection Program and the reason that it's been so popular is that there are loan forgiveness provisions that are available up to the full amount of the loan if you use the funds provided for an allowable um, uh, use. The loan amount that you can receive is two months of average monthly payroll from your past two months plus 25%, but it should be noted that the annual salary cap for computing your average monthly payroll cost is capped at $100,000. The applications for this program opened on April 3rd. As I said, it was initially funded with $349 billion, and we're expecting more funds uh, to appear in that, uh, I, I would hope, within the coming week. Uh, this application for this Paycheck Protection Program is very complex. There are multiple people on your panel tonight who have experience with this application, uh, and it requires a lot of information that you may not readily have on hand. Accordingly, we urge you to enlist the services of your accountant or your professional tax advisor for the application process, uh, make it much, much easier. The intent of the pay Check Protection Program is to, to make it possible for you to maintain operations and keep your staff on payroll. And accordingly, in the loan forgiveness provisions, uh, the allowable uses are limited to the payroll itself for you and your staff, the mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. You're going to have to have accurate records of how the funds were expended. And so you're going to need to, uh, again, engage your professional tax advisor as best how to keep those records so that when the time comes for you to show how you use the funds, you can qualify for the maximum amount of loan forgiveness for the amount received. Number four that we'll talk about is the economic injury disaster loans. As opposed to the Paycheck Protection Program, this program is being administered directly through the Small Business Small Business Administration, not by your local bank. It is also limited to entities of 500 or fewer employees. Should be noted that these are loans. They have very favorable terms, but they are not forgiven. The loan amount is up to $2 million. There's also been some traffic in the press today about um, what part of this may have been expended. A little confusing uh, right now what's out there on it, but um, I would encourage those who haven't to uh, utilize the links that we provide in the resource document that you will see in tomorrow's newsletter uh, and uh, try to click through there if you haven't applied and go ahead and apply for this as quickly as possible. 
Next, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Mark Ader. Uh, Mark is a surgeon at the University Hospital System in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Mark is going to uh, talk to you for a few minutes about practical, practical suggestions and options to consider in the operational aspects uh, to maintain your practice. Mark? Thanks, Patrick. This is really a unique situation for surgeons. We never expected to be here, and, and really, you never really considered uh, having elective surgery uh, off your cash flow at any time. And I, I think it's time, you know, we can really come back and, and, and take a look at this as, as what your practice is, which is really, it's a business. And when you break down the business, you take a look at it in terms of what your operational expenses are. You have fixed expenses, which recur every month, every quarter, and just kind of like clockwork, they're just kind of taken out of your cash flow. Then you have variable expenses, and these are the things that could be seasonal, could be monthly, or it can vary from year to year. This is ones where you have a little bit more flexibility, and and really, as you as you try to keep your practice and, and maintain it without its normal cash flow, it's good to just sit down and really outline which of these expenses are, are fixed and which are variable, because if the variable ones sometimes are contracted expenses, uh, things that uh, where you have different parties coming in uh, to do various sports, these, these may be optional for you. You can, you can certainly have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of your, your cash flow there. Uh, your uh, medical liability uh, is is something that's that's always been fixed, and it's it's right there. And, and there are multiple medical liability carriers uh, that we all participate in. Um, and really, at, at this point, we're not sure how the how these carriers may view our surgical volumes, what we're doing, uh, and what their overall risk was during this time. So rather than have any sort of blanket kind of statement on this, the suggestion here is to call your, your medical liability carrier and find out what sorts of considerations they can make for you during this time of your, really, of your inoperability. You've got to look for flexibility. Uh, and and there's, there's certainly may be some flexibility in these times on things even as basic as your, your rent. Uh, and some of your other fist, fixed expenses, everybody knows we're in a crisis. This is all 50 states. And when you have that, there are certainly no late fees, no uh, no fees uh, of, of trying to kick this down the road a little bit until the cash flow comes back. But if you take a look, you might be able to negotiate out something a little bit different uh, where uh, where you do your business because their costs are going to be less as well. Also meet with your staff. The whole idea is to keep them on staff, keep them secured, keep their health care up to date, keep everything that you want going, and see what considerations they will they will make uh, with you in order to keep the business viable. And then take a look at loans. I and mean, some of you may have student loans out there, and and there are some uh, some ways to defer some of those payments. Uh, down the line, it depends upon uh, who your loan is is through. But take a look at some of the loans that you have, uh, some of these fixed expenses that you've been having every month, and see if there's a way to defer them and and not cause yourself too much grief with a lot of uh, extra interest uh, coming on the backside. The big thing is, and as Patrick mentioned, is to really consult your accountant and your attorney for their insights. This is what you're paying them for. This is where they really have to step up at the plate. Uh, they have to look at your entire operation and see what opportunities there are and actually find out what they've been doing with other practices, hopefully in your area, which uh, which will help guide you as well. On the next slide, I just I have a, a couple of sayings here is when emotion enters the room, the first thing to leave is reason. And really, this is, is very emotional. This is your life. This is your business. But you've got to... You've got to be uh, straight about this. You you really have to be reasonable about looking at what's going on. Don't let that emotion drive your de uh, decisions. As surgeons, our basic characteristic, we have grit. 
That's exactly what we have. That's what got us through our training. That's what gets us through our practice. That's what gets us through every day. That's how we deal with, uh, with things. We, uh, out of all the surgical, out of all the medical specialties, surgeons are really known for their grit and resilience. Uh, we're adaptable and we're able to make things work. So if we look at the next slide, uh, just uh, a real word of advice is to keep a solid wall between your business and your personal accounts. And even though you're stressed at this point, it's your business. And do not leverage your personal savings, your retirement accounts, anything that could compromise your family's future, your future. Don't, that's, that's not the time to put this on the line. You cannot put those family assets at risk. This is not the time to obviously sell your boat or anything like that. Uh, just, just kind of hang tight. But what you can do as a family is to take a look at your family budget and see how you're going to weather the storm. Our incomes are way down. Uh, there's just no, no way around that. But we have to figure out a way around that. And hopefully it's not going to be down for, for very long. One thing to remember, do not miss a disability or life insurance premium payment because you're going to need that. That's part of your long-term financial plan. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money when your cash flow is down. But that, those are the payments that you really cannot afford to miss because you're going to need those policies if you ever have to, uh, if, if you ever have to partake of them. If anybody can give you a deferral on a loan, uh, sometimes you get mortgage deferrals. Sometimes uh, on your car leases, they're offering deferrals uh, for a number of months. Take advantage of anything you see out there like that. Because all you're doing is you're shifting your cash flow from this dry time now or what's going to be coming up over this month, next month, maybe the month after, back to when things get back to normal, hopefully uh, by the third quarter of the year. So, and uh, I think I have a final slide there. Always remember your most valuable business assets are your MD degree and your surgical skills. Out of everybody in this nation, uh, we as surgeons uh, possess skills that are going to be in demand and people are going to need us. We're going to have a business. We're going to be able to, to survive all of this on our skills. So just kind of keep that in mind. That's something to really just, you know, just secure with your family and, and make sure you discuss this with your partner, with your spouse, but educate yourself, get competent advice. And again, do not put your personal finances at risk. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Patrick. Great. Thanks, Mark. We really appreciate that, uh, that input. Uh, very, very good uh, points to be made. We are um, now available to uh, answer your questions, the Practice Protection Committee, as well as uh, the ACS staff. You can enter those questions by typing them in, as I said, in the questions box. I, I will just point out once again, and I hope anybody didn't uh, get writer's cramp during this, uh, tomorrow's newsletter will contain uh, a resource document that uh, uh, covers uh, what we have uh, gone through here tonight and more, uh, along with the links that you need to access the information uh, very readily uh, and hopefully uh, pretty seamlessly. So with that, Matt, I'll let you uh, start with the uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Um, questions are definitely starting to come in. Uh, the first question we have is regarding those who've already applied for the loan and received a loan, um, com a confirmation that their application has been received, but that they have not uh, officially been funded, will they have to go through the process again? Or does it mean that they simply will not receive money now? So I, I would approach that and to answer that question in two different contexts. If this was a paycheck protection uh, loan, I would go back to my bank and see whether or not you had been given a loan number. It is my understanding that once you are given a loan number, then that, that the funds will be forthcoming. But again, that's something that you need to verify 
and confirm with your bank as to whether or not someone who made application but didn't get funded with this round would have to fill out applications again. I, I think that the, the short answer to that is uh, that it will depend on what Congress does. My guess is that, that what they will do is they will simply replenish the funds and then applications that are pending at that time will uh, then filter through. But again, I would urge you to check with your bank about that. Uh, a related question is regarding whether or not any of the panelists have actually successfully participated in any of these programs or, or their facilities or um, their businesses have done so. Uh, would any of the panelists care to speak to that? Yeah, man, this is Mabry. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my experience. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank Dr. Hoyt Bailey and, and Jim Elsey for firing up this committee. This is, this is exactly what the college needs to be doing for the fellows out there because this is a time of, of really stress on everyone, and I appreciate all their work in getting this organized. Uh, for my practice, I applied uh, for the loan. It, it, I do think the, uh, the recommendations are exactly correct. You do need your help of an attorney and or accountant. You may need also the help of a priest, a rabbi, and whoever to, to get this done. But once you get it applied and send it in, uh, then you just wait. I, I talked to the bank today and I was approved. Uh, the, the payment should be coming in in about another week or so. Um, so at least I was one of the ones that was lucky to get it in. Uh, my bank had told me to, to, to get it in the day I called them because they said the funds are going fast and they were exactly correct. But once you do all the, the, uh, the application process and fill in the blanks, it was relatively straightforward. Yeah, Mike Sarup, and I'm a rural surgeon in Ohio. We applied for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, have not received that yet. We went through our local, local bank. We did apply for the advanced payment program and got that check, uh, as Patrick said, it, within seven days. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a big help over the next two or three months. Um, so we've gone through the process. The accountant really helped very much with the paycheck uh, protection program. The advanced uh, payment program was pretty easy. Um, you just ask your staff uh, what you've done in terms of Medicare receipts for the last three months, um, and uh, the application was very simple to, to fill out. I'll, I'll chime in real quick. This is Mark Severis. I work for a, a university health consortium, and um, the, the only thing that we have applied for, we didn't even apply for, but we got, just like everybody else, the 6.1% uh, payment from Medicare. Um, that was automatically deposited with our university medical billing. Uh, and had I not heard of it through the college, I wouldn't even know that it got there. Great, that leads well into one of the other questions that we've received. One, uh, one of our attendees has seen a notice in their bank that there is a, a, a pre-notice for deposit of these funds with a, a sum of zero and was wondering if this means that they will not be receiving this fund or if it is some kind of temporary hold. Any insight? I would uh, suggest that they check with their bank on that. Um, I know that many times statements show up with uh, anticipated activity and based upon what we have heard about the second dispersal of funds from the um, public health and social services emergency fund, um, I would call the bank and ask the question about that and see what information they could provide to you on it. Great, thank you. We've had a couple questions relating to uh, practices that have been forced to furlough or, or send staff home and what the requirements are related to the repayment provisions uh, of the PPP and how to maximize bringing those staff back or how to really be careful as they bring them back to make sure that if this does last longer than the uh, anticipated eight weeks, uh, how do they protect their practice? So there's a, a lot to unpack in there.
I will start off by, by saying that we do know that if you have already uh, laid folks off and then you have applied for the Paycheck Protection Program and if you were funded for that, that you would need to bring those staff back uh, by June the 29th in, or in order to be able to uh, count their salaries uh, relative to the uh, allowable use provisions for loan, for loan forgiveness. But I'm interested to hear what other people thoughts are relative to uh, what they may have done with their staff during this time. Yeah, Patrick, Patrick, maybe. Uh, yeah, this is um, the way we've done that in the college is uh, the uh, staff are working from home, but they are still on salary. So that allowed us to qualify for one of these loans as well. Pat, this memory, as I understand it, the uh, requirements are that you have to show how much you paid the, the, your staff in wages as part of the loan forgiveness, along with your rent and, and other small things. But the big That's ticket item should be a, a, a payment. So if you, if you furloughed your staff, even if you furloughed them just part of the way, then the salary you're paying should still count against that loan forgiveness. That, that's correct. And the, the, the idea is, is that they were just trying to maintain folks on the payroll. The question arose by folks who, before this program was fully funded, you know, had, had let people go. And so the guidance indicated that if you brought them back, you could still count their payment that, that they received uh, in salary for those loan forgiveness provisions as long as you, as you indeed brought them back. Yeah, Mike Sarup, we have uh, we only have seven staff. It's a small practice, and we've been working with half staff. We have not furloughed anybody. Um, we've asked them to um, pick the days that they want to come in, and we've given them the option of taking uh, paid time off or using a vacation day. Um, well, their choice for the for the short term until we figure out long term, but we have not had to furlough anybody as of yet. And Mark Severis again, you know, this is the, the bigger question I think that this gets at is, is uh, you know, you, you have some uh, uh, tools that you can use to help keep people afloat, but what if your practice gets into the situation where you do have to really start making cuts? And those are, those are hard questions to answer. And, and maybe Mark Ader, who has a bit more savvy than I do, can chime in on this as well. Um, but a combination of, of salary reductions, rolling furloughs, um, and uh, and other means might keep everybody relatively whole in this situation. The one point I would make to anybody who's an employer um, is to to try to keep your employees' benefits intact. That's probably the most important thing that you can do. Uh, don't let them lose their health insurance at this time. Decent meeting at the Zoom stuff. Yeah, I I think it's that's a good point, Mark. And and whatever. I would really emphasize to have meetings with your staff really? and to, just to lay everything out and to just say, <laughs> okay, we need to do this. We don't want you to lose your benefits. We want to keep you all here, but we all have to weather this out. We know it's going to come back. We just don't know when. And, you know, if you're like uh, my, my practice, uh, uh, when I was in private practice, I think everybody would just, you know, they 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 would all stand together. But uh, it's it's an individual thing. Just discuss it with your staff and and see what you can work. If you have to make the hard decisions, then you're going to have to make them. On a related question, we have several folks who are, are writing in asking if they can include their own salaries in the application for the payroll protection program. Uh, there are some limitations on that related to the maximum salary that can be included. Um, have any of you who have applied for this included your salaries or, or have any experience with that? Yeah, this may be, I would say the answer to that is yes, you're capped at 100,000. So the calculation is for the 
the math, it's 833, $833 per month that you're capped at. And so that that's that's all you can count for your salary. And then of course your staff adds on to that, but the maximum salary per person is a hundred thousand per year divided by six, and that gives you your total salary you can offset. We included ourselves up to a hundred thousand as well, three surgeons. <clears throat> Switching subjects slightly to the emergency funds that were recently dispersed. Um, Dr. Bailey, you mentioned that there is a um, attestation that you have to fill out. And as part of that, there is uh, a limitation on balance billing of uh, more than in-network fees. Uh, I believe Vanita from our staff is on the line. Would you care to discuss that briefly, Vanita? Yes, sure. Uh, this is Vanita Mazandar, staff of the American College of Surgeons in the DC office. And one of, as, yes, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, for the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund, there are a number of attestations, and it's important in order to keep the funds that, are, that you've received, that you go to the portal that's gonna be in the newsletter tomorrow, or you can contact us and we can, we can share it with you, and fill out those attestations, because otherwise, if it's not filled out within 30 days, um, Medicare will require that you pay it back. The attestations are included in the terms and conditions, which um, will also be in the newsletter tomorrow. There are a couple terms and conditions that are not clear, and we are currently working with HHS to get clarity, and this is one of them. It essentially says that in order to keep the funds, the recipient must certify that it will not seek to collect from the patient out-of-pocket expenses in an amount greater than what the patient would have otherwise been required to pay if the care had been provided by an in-network recipient. One thing we do know is that HHS is viewing all patients as possible COVID cases, so this uh, ban would apply to all patients. We don't know how long it will last. Uh, most of these waivers last for the extent of the public health emergency, um, the national emergency, but this is one area that we are trying to get more clarification on. I will mention also that if you have questions about eligibility or whether a payment has been issued or where the payment has been sent, you can contact the United Health Group's provider relations line, because again, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, HHS is contracted with the United Health Group to um, to provide these disbursements, and that number is 866-569-3522. Again, that's 866-569-3522. Great, thank you, Vanita. We've also been getting some questions about whether hospital employed surgeons are eligible for these payments and how that will occur. Mark Savarese, you wanna address again what, what your experience was there with, uh, with the University of Utah relative to yeah. your uh, situation? Yeah, yeah. So, so as a as an employed physician in a large group, you're not eligible for anything that's under 500 employees. Um, the the packages that that have been talked about are uh, essentially um, aimed towards businesses. Um, the Medicare advance payments um, are available to any physician. So the two Medicare programs, the automatic 6.1 percent payment went to every taxpayer identification number. So that's every physician, whether you're in a large group uh, employed or not, but it went to your whoever manages your Medicare. 
uh, payments. So it, it probably went to your employer. Um, you should definitely talk to your employer about what they did with that money. Uh, we had a, a department meeting yesterday via Zoom uh, where I did exactly that with my department chairman. Um, you are also eligible for the advance payments from Medicare, but again, uh, it's probably going to be done through your employer. Um, otherwise, if you're with a large group, you're, you're not really eligible for these small business uh, uh, administration um, uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, again, everything is pretty much done through your employer. I hope that answers some of the question. This is uh, Julie Conyers. I'm a surgeon in Alaska uh, in the rural parts. So we, we did uh, talk with our, we're part of a 10 hospital system and uh, we did ask how much they did receive for the Medicare advance payment and we're asking for how much they receive for the uh, emergency fund. But I think those are all good questions. The other point is if you are employed, this is a good time to look at your employment contract and what sort of provisions are in your employment contract. And I think that could be important moving forward. This Charles Mary, one thing I do want to add is some of the employed physicians are actually employed through their own PA or LLC. They're therefore they're 1099 employees, not W-2 employees. And for those, you you do qualify for the payment protection plan since you are still running your own business, even though one of your biggest vendors is the hospital in that instance, you're actually running your own business, and therefore you can apply for the a payroll protection plan and some of these other things uh, along with uh, uh, just as if you were in private practice without a 1099 contract. Switching to a new topic, we received a question related to the uh, employment tax credit that was uh, a part of one of the earlier relief bills and whether or not that is compatible with the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Yeah, it is our understanding that uh, if you do the tax for deferral that uh, it's mutually exclusive with the uh, loans from the Small Business Administration, but that is one of those questions that I would absolutely engage my professional tax advisor about um, to get to get a definitive answer and to get their to get their advice about how the best path or which of the two best paths was most appropriate in your circumstance. As a follow up to our earlier responses about inclusion of uh, physician income in the payroll protection program application. We've received some questions about what people might do if they did not include their own income in that request when they filed with the Small Business Administration or with the lender. Charlie, you got any, any thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think you know, the obvious answer would be that you could reapply with an amended application form since it's going to your local bank. They at least will understand the, you know, the whoopsie, the sorry that we missed it. I think this points out, though, that, that you know, using your CPA, they should be able to tell you to include your salary on that application, even though it's capped at 100000 uh, but you have to, in essence, uh, reapply the loan, cancel the loan, reapply it, and whether or not there's funds there or not, that's another matter. But I think that's your, that would be the option that you have to do is use your your accountant and work with your local bank officer that's in charge of SBA loans, and then try to reapply with the correct numbers. Great, thank you very much.
On the uh, economic disaster loans, we've received a question from someone who applied and was told that they would receive a deposit within three days for the, the $10,000, but they have not heard anything. Uh, we've learned as of today that the funds uh, associated with that have been expended. Any suggestions for um, how to proceed? Yeah, what I would do is I would go back uh, through the same mechanism that you use to apply for that uh, economic injury disaster loan uh, through the portal. Um, and we'll have a link to that portal if you no longer have it uh, in the newsletter tomorrow and see if you can't wind your way through. It, 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 you've gone through the process. You understand that there was a series of check boxes that you have to do and it takes you to the next page, take you to the next page and see if there's not uh, uh, some sort of a number provided. If you were told that you were going to, that you were approved, um, I would at least be cautiously optimistic that it might be still forthcoming. But um, since that program is administered specifically through the SBA itself and not through your local bank, like the Paycheck Protection Program, I think your best recourse is to go to the SBA itself. Just a, a quick comment. This marks Everese again. Um, you know, there there are stories in the in the press about uh, some problems with the rollout of several of these programs and some people not getting their money. Uh, so it's not surprising that some people have not through one snafu or another. And the, the advice that Dr. Bailey just gave is is the obvious right answer. Go back, chase it down. Um, you're probably not alone, and it's not surprising that there are people on this call who haven't received uh, disbursements that they thought they should be receiving by now. We have questions from a few individuals who are not incorporated or solo practices or independent contractors wondering if they can apply for the maximum 100,000 salary limit for themselves. That's good, we're gonna leave it, we're gonna leave it right there. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, this is Tyler. If, uh, you, if you're an independent contractor, just like uh, we were saying earlier, you're running a business of your own, and uh, I think I would at least check with your CPA and, and uh, tax lawyer to make sure you're not running a foul of the law, but it, it's not a bad thing to at least take a run in it. The next question we have is regarding the payments through Medicare from HHS, um, whether or not these funds can run out like the SBA funds ran out, or are these guaranteed? So, well, Matt, are we taking from context that we're, that we're referring to the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund? I believe that's correct. Okay. So, that fund was $100 billion, um, and the first uh, dispersal of those funds was, as we said, last Friday, uh, and we are anticipating a second dispersal, uh, perhaps as early as tomorrow. But uh, the short answer is yes, there is a cap on those funds as it currently exists, and there's $70 billion of the $100 billion in funds that remains. How they divide that up into whether it's two, it's going to be at least two more dispersals based on what we were reading in the press. How they divide that money up and what they target is still the source of some uh, speculation at this point in time, but we should hopefully have some more definitive information about it uh, before the end of the week. Great, thank you. We have a question here trying to distinguish between the two SBA loan programs. Uh, the question is, which of the two loans needs to be repaid and what are the criteria for forgiveness? So, 
So there's 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 several key differences between the two S SBA programs. Uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, the one we we spent the, the most had the most questions about tonight, is the one that has the loan forgiveness provisions, and you apply for that one through your local SBA approved lender. It is also the program that we are uh, very confident, based on reports in the press, that the initial three hundred and forty nine billion dollars that was put into that has now been expended. The reason it is so popular is because it had the loan forgiveness provisions and in broad strokes, the uh, things that can be forgiven, the, the allowable uses, if you will, are, are your payroll, uh, your rent, your mortgage interest, and your utilities. Um, the other program, the EIDL program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, that's the program that you apply for directly through the SBA itself and the SBA's website. And there are, I would note there are no loan forgiveness provisions for the economic injury disaster loans. And then it's just important to point out the other part of that question. The EIDL can be used for any business expenses. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program is specific about what's required for payback. You can use it for anything, but if you don't use it for the appropriate payroll, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities, then there's a portion of it that you will have to pay back without loan forgiveness. Yeah, that's a great point, Mark. And, and one of the one of our group had suggested that um, even taking out the economic injury disaster loan and then putting it in the bank and then using that if you needed to down the road to repay uh, your Medicare advance payments, uh, might be a good uh, good use for those funds, and then if you didn't need it, could you just you could just pay it back. Our next question is related to the advance payments or the uh, emergency fund payments and the attestation about providing direct diagnosis, treatment, or testing of COVID nineteen. Uh, they were wondering if they will have to re give back this money because they are not directly involved in diagnosis and testing of COVID. So, Manita, you want to give what our what, what we think our our interpretation of their guidance is thus far? Yes. So, the one of the bullets in the terms and conditions says that a recipient must pro have provided, uh, either currently provide or um, had provided um, diagnoses, testing, or care for individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID-19 um, after January 31st, 2020. HHS, um, recently revised their um, website to state that the agency considers or the department considers all patients as potential cases of COVID-19. So that component is, um, it, it applies to everybody, all patients. What's more confusing that is Another question that we are currently actively working on getting clarification and should have clarification in the next day or so is a separate bullet under the terms and conditions. This is the third bullet that indicates that a recipient must certify that the payment will only be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus and shall reimburse the recipient only for healthcare uh, related expenses or lost revenues that are attributed to coronavirus. So this is the one that um, is probably the most problematic one for us. And we are um, working to get clarification that suspended elective surgeries do count as preventing, preparing for, and responding to coronavirus. And we'll have more to come on that soon.
Great, thank you. One of the more common comments that we're receiving is related to um, bad experiences with applying for the Paycheck Protection Act or the need for federal oversight of how these funds are being dispersed. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a question that we will be able to answer as the American College of Surgeons, uh, but there um, will definitely be some federal oversight of this. Does anyone on the panel wish to speak about the process or um, how quickly these this whole program was rolled out? Well, j just for context, the regulations regarding how this funding was to be um, handed out were still being drafted in the days leading up to the application being open. So it's it's understandable with the volume of loans and the uh, short term, um, the short time period for which they had to uh, promulgate these regulations that they were some heartburn. Um, hopefully, Congress will get its act together and add additional funds, um, but we will definitely be keeping an eye open on how these funds are dispersed, and I'm sure there will be congressional oversight. Our next question is related to uh, some of the comments that Dr. Ader had said about keeping your personal finances and your professional finances separate and about how many practices are, are taking pay cuts in this time to try and keep their staff on, and how do you really keep that balance as you move forward? I think the best thing to do is to sit down and, and do a personal budget with your spouse, significant other, uh, partner, uh, and to figure out exactly what you really need for cash flow and in order to be able to maintain your household. It's gonna to be tough for a few months. It, it really is. And you have to look at those opportunities of, of where, you can, where you can really cut. I mean, if you're on uh, stay at home provisions, uh, my guess is your credit card bills and your, your restaurant bills are way down. Uh, and, but that's just a, a small example but you can you can just take a look at, at where you can actually shift things. When you start taking money out of your retirement accounts, even though there is a provision that uh, you actually can do that now, that's a very dangerous thing because you put that money away as an investment. That's your that's your retirement fund. That's what's going to get you out for the long term. And the market took a, a big dive. It had a, a full correction into a bear market. It was over 20%. But part of it has come back. And if you pull your money out of those particular investments, you could be missing some of the best days of the rallies uh, that are going to be there. So I would be real hesitant about digging that far into your investment savings and just taking a look at where you could budget. And uh, I, I was uh, looking uh, at some of the mortgage services and, and it depends upon your bank. Some of them are giving a, <clears throat> excuse me, a forbearance for a number of months, adding that on to the end of the loan, uh, of course, with the interest accruing, but that may be one of the methods, uh, certainly car payments. Um, I got a letter from uh, one of my uh, lease agencies that uh, they're willing to defer payments for up to three months and extend it out uh, for another three months on the lease. And there are things that you can really look at like that. Certainly uh, cutting, cutting all those optional things that you really don't need, uh, especially on the short term. This is Julie Conyers. <laughs> Um, one other thing is to avoid a line of credit where you have to use your own personal assets as collateral. And that was a practice that I was familiar with in Boise where they were trying to keep their 56 CRNAs on board and the anesthesiologists were required to use their own personal assets for the line of credit. 
So those are, if you can stay away from those, that's much more ideal for preserving your own assets. And this is Tyler Hughes. I would just add that, you know, although this is a worldwide pandemic and uh, globally uh, has an impact, to those of us who are in small private practices, the strategies are much the same as if you had broken your arm or gotten in a bad car wreck or contracted a serious illness, and that the strategies that you would have used to tide yourself through that sort of event are basically the same, and these other government programs are additional helps that can get you through. So again, what Dr. Ader said about not letting emotion run wild, uh, you know, most of you probably have had a strategy for those sort of things. Think upon those and then use these other assets and uh, opportunities uh, to help soften the blow. Great. Well, I uh, I want to thank all of our uh, all of our panelists. Thank Dr. Hoyt, uh, Christian, Benita, Matt, um, and our uh, Practice Protection Committee for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to collect your questions, and uh, we'll be uh, updating our resource document in the newsletter, uh, and we'll uh, point you to that. Uh, and fully expect that uh, as this continues. Uh, that we'll have additional webinars in the future uh, where we will present you updated information and uh, have another round uh, of good exchange here to pass information back and forth. Again, thank you very much for uh, tuning in tonight, uh, and we wish you uh, safety. Um, good night.